So welcome to um, VDK community meeting. Today we're going to be talking about um, the latest release of VDK. Um, then we have Paul uh, who is going to pre present um, Hugging Face and uh, how he works uh, with VDK. Um, and uh, then we're going to go through a roadmap and uh, talk about what is planned for the next six months um, or maybe even more um, uh, for VDK. If you're here for the first time, because this is kind of, uh, we have a, today a bit bigger group of people here, I'm just going to quickly introduce um, uh, what we're talking about, what is VDK. So here you have, we have a team or group of people who are actually developing this open source uh, framework for data engineers to develop, run and uh, manage data workloads. And it is basically covering uh, two parts. One is the development of the data pipelines and uh, one is deployment um, uh, to production or deployment of the of the data jobs or data pipelines. And um, our repository is here. I, I can quickly share the link in the chat if you want to check it out. And uh, yeah, I think we can start uh, with, with the agenda. Mm. Anthony? I'm the first one. Yeah, you are with the release. But if you think we can also start with Paul, it depends on you. Yeah, that's fine. That's... Good. Uh, yeah, every community meeting, we are discussing what was released in the last month and what are the new improvements. Uh, the release nodes are found in releases. Uh, this is part of umbrella release because VDK is multiple components and plugins. Uh, so the latest release is something we have, well, yeah, 101. And some of the uh, major features that include are uh, supports, uh, so our style data kit is a framework uh, which provides uh, different uh, interfaces for ingesting data, transforming data, but also for saving properties, uh, for keeping managing state during data job runs. And uh, with the latest release, it also provides a possibility for uh, users to manage their secrets. Uh, their backend and frontend parts. The backend part is uh, when people are installing the backend versatile data key control service, they can configure a vault instance. Uh, this is something that the platform IT team will do, while the front end, well, one of the front end parts, which was saved the last month, is uh, the CLI, which allows people to manipulate secrets using uh, uh, the VDK control CLI, which is a CLI which provides a lot of different interfaces for interacting with the control service. Uh, so, for example, they can set secrets using VDK secrets minus minus set, my key, my value, or multiple secrets at once and much more. Uh, the second bigger change of our style data kit uh, so far has been primarily developed as a directory, uh, a data jobs a directory for SQL and Python steps, uh, which uh, while fairly powerful, well, it uh, was not that easy to use. Uh, we are working on notebook integration, which will provide this kind of seamless way to create data job using entire notebook and then directly produ productionize them and deploy them from the notebook. And uh, in the last month, one thing that uh, was enabled is the ability to convert from direct style to notebook style data job. Uh, so there's uh, this is how when, when you install the Jupyter extension for VDK, you get these commands, including cover job to notebook. Uh, you can point to previous data job, which was directory with SQL Python steps, and automatically transfer it to a notebook with uh, some uh, guide, uh, basically a notebook job. Here are details about how each is executed. A notebook job is something like this. Each file will be translated to each SQL file will be translated to SQL to Python cell using jump input execute query. Uh, the same way, uh, it all automatically will be, ta will be tagged with a VDK cell. That means that during deployment, those cells will be uh, deployed 
uh, for production execution. Uh, Python cells are similarly uh, simply called Python steps are simply created as a Python cells. Uh, also, as part of uh, to enable for people to actually to use the extension, uh, it's now published in Puppy. Uh, it's still a prototype, so yeah, people should expect issues with it if anybody decides to use it. But people can start people can start with the Jupyter App extension, the Jupyter installation, and they'll be able to use both the above interface for creating. And uh, they'll be able to use also access to the uh, the new menus. And finally, uh, a new POC plugin was introduced, which uh, with the case Marta, which is a POC integration with OpenAI uh, with GPT. Uh, in this POC, people uh, when they run the install the plugin, and all the, the data jobs will be able to get a review of each SQL query that executed by the data job. Uh, so once you enable, once you install the plugin, enable open AI review enable to true, uh, people will get some kind of a report for each SQL executed uh, with a score from one to five and a review about what could be improved. It's a POC, so it's pre-alpha. So again, it's a, uh, meant to showcase how BDK can be extended. And uh, yeah, that's uh, basically what we've done in the last month. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony. So Paul, whenever you're ready. So, hey guys, so my name is Paul Murphy and I'm a developer on the the versatile data kit project. Um, obviously, sorry. Paul, I think we're we're yeah. seeing your. Yeah, I don't know which screen, but yeah, you're correct. So I'm um uh oh mm -hmm. same again. Sorry about that. Now we saw the GitHub repo. Yeah. Oh, you did. Okay, perfect. So you guys can see. Yes. Over. Perfect. Okay, so before we talk about uh, VDK, before we talk about like improving LLM workflows, I'm just going to quickly run through what VDK is and very briefly what Hugging Face is. So Versatile Data Kit is like um, a data processing platform. It's like a set of libraries and also kind of infrastructure for running that code on. So you can write Python code or SQL codes, develop it locally. There's kind of, you know, if you write SQL codes, you can read from one database and write to another, and then you can push it onto Kubernetes infrastructure. You can also write jobs within your notebooks, like develop a proof of concept in a notebook, a Jupyter notebook, and then push it onto the cluster for when you're ready to go to production. Um, it, I, so, and then I hope everyone knows what Hugging Face is, but Hugging Face is basically the most popular library when it comes to like training LLMs, fine tuning LLMs, even like when browsing data sets or browsing inference models, like Hugging Face is by far the most popular library out there for this. So, we, if we, for VDK to be beneficial in um, LLM workflows, what we see as being the most, the most prudent step forward is to take Hugging Face and augment its functionality when it runs on the VDK ecosystem. So if you follow a Hugging Face tutorial, they are always very clear, but even so it does often take some time to get set up. And the Hugging Face tutorials always focus on running it on your, running it, you know, they don't focus on getting it to production. Like they just tell you how to write the model to a local directory. So I'm going to go through, also one other important thing is like, this is something we plan, we plan on implementing all this functionality. 
But as an open source project, we're not going to build something unless we have like a team that wants to partner with us that will use it. Like we're not going to build something unless someone's ready to use it or someone there's someone showing immediate interest in it. Or even more, even better would be that some team is looking just to, because it's an open source project, they could build this themselves and we could advise on it. So the first workflow we're going to focus on is fine tuning an LLM when using Hugging Face. So when you're using, so when you're using Hugging Face, you can follow a basic tutorial like this for fine tuning, where you create your tokenizer pull in your data set, and then you would start the fine tuning. One of the most important things when you're running uh, fine tuning in real life is that you can report the metrics in real time to a reporting platform. So like there are many different reporting ML reporting platforms out there. There's WMB, Neptune, or MLflow, among others, even TensorBoard would be something similar. Um, Obviously, you report the the current law, the loss, the current loss while training is happening, and you report like the perplexity or uh, so that what what this helps someone do is while they're while training is happening, they can see how it's performing. Is it beating existing models? If it's not beating existing models, maybe it's time to kill it. Um, and it is important to notice, know that Hugging Face actually does provide excellent integration with these already in place. Like to get Hugging Face working with WMB, you only have to specify the reports to WMB and set up the credential, the art credentials locally. So Hugging Face does provide good support, but but like what we propose to do is that at a cluster level, so wherever you deploy your hugging face fine tuning jobs to, the reporting layer will be configured for the entire cluster. So an admin will go in and set up, I want to report to WMB. Here is my username, here is my password. This means that, it, that as a developer, all I have to do is focus on writing my fine tuning tasks and deploy it to the cluster and the reporting is handled by the cluster, by the admin. This means that um, if at a later stage you want to change reporting platform, the admin only has to do one change on the cluster. All jobs will start reporting to a new pla reporting platform. Also, we will provide like consistent naming formats. Like I've worked as a machine learning engineer before and always the job runs at these like names that only made sense at the time. And like when you're going through historical when you're trying to figure out, you know, why was that model so good? Often it's very hard to figure out because someone had run the training on their local machine. You're not exactly sure what commit they used, all that kind of information. So when we report them <laughs> at the cluster level, you'll say, I want to report to WMB. And when we report the metrics there, we will report them with the exact commits that of the code that generated that um, model. And all the, like, obviously it's quite simple, but just the naming across the company, across the cluster will always be standardized as opposed to this more ad hoc process that most teams work with at the moment. Plus like, you know, there's the standard concerns with username and password sharing, like this way developers never have to get involved with username and passwords. Um, so basically, like the problems we're solving here is that it's consistent naming. You can, there's a full audibility trace of where these metrics came from. We know that you can't just run something on your local machine anymore because it has to be pushed to the cluster. And to be pushed to the cluster, it has to be checked into Git. So that's the first thing we would look to support. The next thing we would look to support, Hugging Face as a data set API. So if you want to train on like a question answering data set, you say, uh, Hugging Face, this is my data set, please load it for me. Hugging Face has excellent, like an excellent caching layer and an excellent streaming system. 
So when you run it, if you're running it, if you can provision a machine and you are say tuning hyperparameters, if you run it many times, you won't have to resync the data set. But in production, we normally try and keep stuff reasonably stateless. Like we want to deploy a job to Kubernetes and in Kubernetes, the pods are mostly stateless. What we, what we want to do in VDK is that um, when we know it's a LLM, when we know it's a hug and face job, we will always attach the same persistent volume stores to for the ca for the caching data set caching. This way, that if you're fine tuning a model and you're deploying ten different versions of the, if you're deploying ten different versions of the fine tuning with different hyperparameters, they will all share the same caching layer, and then you get kind of the benefits of Kubernetes in that like you know the code was checked in, you know that it's resilient to failures on the local machine, but also you get the caching benefits provided by Hug and Face. This will obviously save IO for the company and make, fine, make rerunning tasks or restarting tasks much faster. So, if you look at the uh, Hug and Face tutorial again, say, so when you're do, doing fine tuning with Hug and Face, you, you're asked to specify the output directory. This can be anything, this can be a Google bucket or um, an Azure storage. Any, this can be anything, but it's really, but like you would run it locally and save it locally. And this results in like models getting lost or models having weird names. What we pro propose is that when you deploy a fine tuning job or any LLM hugging based job, training job on the BDK infrastructure, we will take care of the naming convention. So the model will all, the, the, the all models for the company will always be stored like in the same storage layer that and they'll always have consistent naming format and along with consistent naming format they will also be registered in if you have a model serving layer like um yeah uh, vmware has an internal one but also if say if you were using the hugging face inference model hub well, then we will register the models there and we will register them with the commit IDs and stuff to provide clear traceable history. Like this just means that as a hugging face, as a developer fine tuning model, all you have to think about is fine tuning. You don't have to worry about like, you know, not redeploying too many times because, you know, it's not, you're gonna have to resync the data every time. You don't have to worry about where the model is saved or registering the model. We really try and focus on all the nitty gritty stuff so you can just focus on writing the fine tuning. And lastly, we want to help productionize fast. So what we will provide is the VDK um, has like Jupyter notebooks. And you could open up your Jupyter notebook, a uh, copy and paste the code from any tutorial, any tutorial like this into it, run it and then run it on Jupyter and then deploy it to the VDK ecosystem. And we would and deploy it to the VDK ecosystem. And then we would run it in production for you. If there were errors, it would go through our normal error reporting platform where like emails would be sent to the relevant teams. We also will provide base Docker images with all the important dependencies already um, set up correctly for the cluster. Like often it can be quite difficult. Like it's not so bad now, but if you have a Mac M2, just a few months ago, it's been, it, was, it, was, it was quite difficult to get. Hello? It just like, um, a couple of months ago, it has been quite hard to like, you know, get uh, the training running on your machine with the correct version of PyTorch and the correct version of CUDA. So basically what we aim to do is from zero to one, like 
once you see this tutorial that you're trying to follow or you're trying to implement, we will help you get that running quickly. And then we'll help you move from getting that running quickly to getting that running in production just as fast, because that's like what the, VD, the VDK team specialize in. If you have jobs, if you've written Python code, whatever it is, we can help you run it reliably with clear reporting, clear error handling, handling. And if there's issues, like you'll be emailed and notified about it. Like then also because it's a Kubernetes cluster, obviously admins can add GPUs and take them away. And, and then obviously if developers move between teams, it becomes much easier because there's consistency across the, because there's consistency across all teams, it becomes easier for developers to move between teams. Um, so that's the first workflow, which is um, speeding up fine tuning or full training, if that's what you're looking to do. And um, does anyone have any questions on that? Okay, I'll um, move on to the second workflow now. Um, okay, so the second workflow we're going to talk about is um, leveraging VDK. Are, sorry, just one question. Like, are people familiar with Hugging Face? Do people like people on this call use Hugging Face on a daily basis? It would be nice if you react, if you are using it, maybe with thumbs up or something, so yeah. we can see maybe how many people are using it. And just out of curiosity, have you have you been able to, like, the things I'm saying, do you agree, oh, they would be useful? Or, like, obviously, we're more of an infrastructure team. We're more, like, a, less focused on the actual business use cases and focused on facilitating people to meet the business use cases, would you see that like this would be a useful set of tools for you? Like, do you write your hugging face jobs at the moment and wonder where to deploy it, how to deploy it? Is that a problem people encounter? Okay, in the chat, there are um, four people that are saying uh, that they're using oh, and- Oh, brilliant. Yeah, and definitely that's a problem. Okay. Okay, brilliant. Um, Aggie, can you keep track of the people and maybe we'll reach out to them after? Yeah. So next we're going to talk about like data set creation. So as I was saying, like, you know, Hugging Face is amazing. Like the Hugging Face data set repository is just... So you're very quiet, you'll have to speak up. Okay, so I just assumed there's no question. Um, so as I was saying, like Hugging Face is a great API for loading in data sets for training. But it doesn't really give you tell you how to create a data set. So um, let me just go through the problem scenario. So basically, we want VDK to be an invaluable tool when it comes to preparing data sets for LLMs. Like there are already many frameworks and libraries which focus on the ease of use when streaming and versioning LLM data sets. Also, what I forgot to mention as well is that Hugging Face data sets are stored in Git. So they naturally have state of the art versioning, which is brilliant. Um, so for VDK to make the greatest return, again, like we are only looking to augment the functionality of the Hugging Face data set infrastructure as opposed to build something from scratch. And let's go through the problem use case. So you're tr the problem arises. Okay, so imagine you work for Stack Overflow 
And your goal is to fine tune an existing model on all your internal question and answer pairs from Stack Overflow. You have a database which looks like so. What is Java? It's a programming language. Is Linux or Mac more popular? Basically just a list of question and answers and you want to fine tune an existing model on this. Obviously it's a production database and so it has many updates per hour. So how do I train? So as a machine learning engineer, I'm not that familiar with, I'm very comfortable with Hogan Face, but I'm not that familiar with like different databases or ETL processes. So how do I train? Well, the first way you could train is you could just read from the database directly. Hogan Face has tons of examples of reading from a SQL database and how you could train on that data. Obviously, this is like not ideal. There's two reasons that it's terrible. It's one is your training, your machine learning model training is putting load on the production database. But like actually secondly, and probably more importantly, is you're training on a mutable data set. Because the data set is constantly changing, um, if, if in a week someone is able to train a model that outperforms the current model, we won't know did it outperform it because the model is actually better, or is it just because the, the data is now better? So what we want to always do is we always want to train on immutable data sets so that when we are training a new model, we can compare against previous models. So this would lead to this, the second approach, which is like kind of how most teams would get started. You just take a snapshot of the database at that moment in time and you start your training. Um, if the model is quite easy to develop, you know, this will lead to you developing the, you know, if you can develop the model in a week or two, this will lead you to developing the best model. However, this is terrible on three fronts, especially if you get to production. First of all, you as the the longer it takes to develop the model, the more stale the data set gets. So you might train a model and then you might, as you go to production, realize that there has been distribution shift since the training has taken place. And the model underperforms on newer questions compared to how you thought it was going to perform. Also, there's lack of traceability. Like you might have to ask someone on another team to do the dump for you and then they zip it and put it in a bucket for you and then you download it. If something like cleanup is done on it, like removing bot traffic, that might not be documented anywhere. It might've been a manual step. I'm honest, like cleaning up data sets a lot of the time is quite manual. And it can just lead to track lack of traceability. And also, this is a lot of work. Like, often you'll have to reach across teams to get a dump of the data set. And the person who's responsible for getting these dumps or managing these dumps might leave. Like with everything in a software company, like we want to make sure it's automated. And like, no matter how many people leave, you're still going to be creating high quality data set every to every week or every few days. So this is where VDK can come in. With the VDK, you can say, like, I want to read the, the question, the answer from Postgres, and I want to ingest it into this database, which is, yeah. I want to ingest it into this database, which is the hugging, like either hugging face hub or Insta ML. Um, so, and then you say like, I want to do it every day. What we will do is we will like, as new, for all the new rows that come in per day, we will add them to the existing data set and version it. Like that obviously happens, it's just naturally most data set storage layers. So obviously this is brilliant because so there's pure traceability. Anytime a model is trained, we'll know what commit it was trained on. This makes it trivial to compare models. Um, Obviously, you have to write the initial um, no code mapping to push the data into the, the data source layer. But after this, there's no work required by developers. And also you get the, like the guarantees of running on the VDK ecosystem. Like, you know, if there's failures, database connection failures, you know, we'll manage the retries. Um, also, it ends up in like the, the, the data sets hugging based data sets thing. So we can, we will provide all the metadata to like your 
data set storage layer like Hugging Face about the schema so that you'll be able to browse, obviously just all the benefits that come with storing a data set in Hugging Face, like you can just browse it in the UI. Like if you publish it, you know, you can see all the, you can see an example of rows and query it. Um, so that's basically how we look to help people in creating um, Hugging Face data sets is we will, you know, update them periodically and you won't need to mess with the Hugging Face API. We will manage that in that um, syncing ingestion into Hugging Face or for someone, for you guys. Um, again, I don't know if people think that's useful or not useful. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through one more example. This one's obviously a bit more out, a bit more uh, long term, but like we see that, like if you are using VDK, VDK for, you know, um, you for for like collecting your data sets, we can actually, you know, build in kind of catches to like prevent regressions and stuff in your LLM model. So, say for example, so. Like to some extent, LLMs are still back black boxes. Like bad training data often won't throw exceptions, and it can make debugging models extremely difficult. Like so, VDK would aim to aim to assist in understanding your training data and catch bad training data before it can ruin your model. For example, imagine your task your team is tasked with fine tuning a copilot like model on company internal files from private repos. So obviously, I don't know if people know what Copilot is, but Copilot is a Microsoft tool that helps you program. Um, you might want to try and tune it on different language or private files that only you have. So in the obviously in the initial fine tuning steps, you'll be working on the model for a while and a lot of care will be taken to make sure that all the files that are used for training and all the code that is used is of good quality and makes sense. It's not like transpiled nonsense or binaries for some reason. It's all good quality code. And this is an often fairly manual. Now you go into production, and obviously it's important with a model like that to update it periodically, update it regularly, because new libraries are always coming out, new versions of APIs are always coming out. So you need to update it regularly. So, and ex so it is important that it updates at least once a week. So the so imagine issue one, the copilot tool, it's working extremely well, but then we start to see a loss of perplex a loss and perplex perplexity met. So and it, the tool is working well. We report a loss and perplexity metric on a test set separately for each language. And we notice that over the last four weeks, we've seen that the that the loss metric on the test set for Java is increased. So we're performing worse on Java. We just don't know why, but it it only it's only after train only after training it that we see this. Because the loss has increased, we don't can't release any new versions of the product until there is an understanding of the root cause. This is the this is the spike model performing better for all of our languages. After an investigation, it is found that the amount of Java fourteen code within the company has increased significantly in the last month. Okay, in the test set, there was no Java 14 code. And Java 14 has a new keyword and concept for this being records. So Java 14 has new keywords that our model just can't predict because it's never seen Java 14 code. And there's no Java 14 code in the test set. So even if it learns to predict Java 14 code, it's not going to be rewarded for that. So our model, so... So what we see that we could do is that like as files are coming, as new files are being processed, we would check that we would run them against the current model. And if the perplexity is high, we would say that this file seems suspicious. It's unnaturally difficult for this, this, um, this model to predict. And so there, 
So we would send e warning emails with a list of files that should be investigated. This way you could prevent ahead of time, you would know that there are these new keywords. So, but also, so you wouldn't waste time training because you would have a warning saying, you know, it's not going to do well on these files. Another example would be like that if <clears throat> you were seeing that the last metric was gone up for JavaScript and it's not obvious why. And basically after an investigation, you realize that, um, that it's because you were accidentally including some transpiled code. The filter wasn't working correctly and transpiled JavaScript is getting in which the model wasn't able to predict. Again, like simply, you know, as you're creating your data set, if we just check the perplexity of the files, we would be able to prevent wasted GPU on training and prevent difficulty bugging. Um, and we would build like metrics like that into your data set creation pipelines if people were using the VDK ecosystem to create their test sets. No, they're not the, their data sets, test sets, training sets, validation sets, everything. Um, again, does that sound like something that would be useful or is it clear because if it's not clear, I'm happy to dig into it further. Um, Paul, I don't know if you're checking the chat, but there's sometimes uh, people oh. are uh, yeah, yeah. sending something there. But I also think it's okay to maybe check afterwards or. Um, oh, brilliant. Okay, so yeah, like just to be clear, like you know, InstaML would support some of this functionality. VDK is different in that, like, it's an open source project that, um, You know, it's an open source project. You can just run it on your own infrastructure. And I suppose InstaML is mostly not really meant for going to production as well, I would say, that it's like notebooks. You write your notebook, but then it's not clear if you want to do a uh, retrain a model every day. It's not maybe not so clear how to do that. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with the deep thought framework. Like it is very likely that there's competitors out there. Does anyone have any other questions? No. Um, hey Paul. Uh, hi. My name is Raghav. I have one quick question here. Uh, so you said you're leveraging hugging face. So can we uh, use this in, in production? Like, are there any licensing uh, requirements? Like, uh, can we just uh, use the VDK in production or uh, is it mainly for doing experiments in our product releases? Can we use it? No, VDK is an open source tool and it's used in production by uh, VMware already. But it's most, it's used in production for like, more standard ETL workflows, more standard data processing workflows. But it is, you know, reliable in production. So, yeah, if you wanted to use, um, maybe you could reach out to me after. Like, if you were looking to use it in production, we could definitely assist. Yeah, yeah. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so message me. So, uh, are you a VMware employee or are you? Yes, yes. Yeah, if you message me on Slack, then certainly I can, we can discuss it further. Sure, thank you. No problem. I'm curious how the, to the audience, out of all those things that Paul discussed, uh, what is the thing that caught your attention? You can just write it down in the message box, if you want, in the chat. What was like something that you'd really like to see? Because most of those things are not yet built. Uh, some of those are easier to build, some not. 
So it would be really helpful to get a, yeah, if you want to just write in Slack or in, uh, I mean, in the chat, what you like to see, what is something that really caught your attention. Mm, there's a question if VDK is already available or is it being built? Okay, so VDK is already available, but yeah, mostly at the moment, it's for standards like data processing, you know, ingest data from a third party system, perform transformations on it, save it in your data lake or your data mark or your databases, and then like report it into your BI tools. It is available and it's production ready or even it's used in production in VMware. But the, all these parts, the hugging face interoperability parts or the uh, hugging face augmenting parts, they're what we're looking to build once we can partner with either individuals or a team who would be interested in using this. And like, ideally they would say to us, this is the feature we want first. This is the feature we want next. So we can, it helps us prioritize it. Yes, we have integration with Greenplum. We already have a, a Greenplum um, a Greenplum plugin, so you could ingest your data straight from there in seconds. Sorry, I'll just scroll through the rest of the questions. Yeah, VDK is so VDK is related to Super Collider in that Super Collider is the name for the for VDK internal well, internally, but they're basically the same code base. With well, the Super to be more precise. Not. Well, one component of super quiet data pipelines is VDK. They, of course, are the components that are not VDK. <laughs> also, if there are any further questions, we can uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, yeah, uh, just ask because here we can have a conversation. Uh, you're very welcome to uh, talk. So yeah, I have a quick yeah, question about uh, what's the, let's say, what makes VDK different than Airflow or uh, Astronomer? Well, um, Antonio, do you want to maybe ask, compare it to, I'm not familiar with Astronomer, but maybe Antonio, do you want to compare it to Airflow? So uh, Astronomer is a, uh basically are full, but managed and paid. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 Airflow is a task orchestration tool. Uh, so you can orchestrate your task in a DAC and schedule them. Uh, well, there's a bit of a horror overlap, but not much, but a bit in terms of uh, the control service where you can also orchestrate tasks. Uh, but uh, VDK also aims to be a bit more higher level. That is, it provides interfaces for ingesting, transforming data, specific uh, plugins for different destinations of ingestion uh, and uh, templates for transformations. Uh, like uh, Paul mentioned, it's uh, very much focused around the ETL use case until now. So it has templates, for example, for creating the uh, star schema, dimensional modeling data warehouse, basically. Uh, so it's more of a data aware, data oriented to while uh, Astronomer and uh, Air for really task oriented to task orchestration. Mm, we also have a blog post published on this and I, I just linked it in the chat. Yeah, VDK is more built for data ETLs compared to Air for altering task scheduling. It's accurate. Ahmed. Thank you. Um, oh, hey, this is Liwei. Do you have a, uh, a list of uh, sort of our internal business units currently leveraging this um, uh, this platform to uh, ingest their data? Yeah, we can get that for you. All um, right. Antoni, do you have that? Yeah, like just write to us and we can get it to you on Slack or on any channel you want. And also it is uh, actually safe to actually um, ingest our internal data into the platform. Is nothing leaving the premise? Well, but style data kits uh, 
two key that you deploy and install. It's deployed inside VMR, so if you use the internal VMware installation, yes. You can deploy it and point it to any di di direction destination. Uh, as long as it's pointed to internal destination, yeah, for VMware. So internally, like there's the Super Collider project, and as a VMware employee, you will use the Super Collider project. So you won't be using VDK directly, but the Super Collider project encompasses VDK. And when you use that, your data won't leave VDK, um, VMware. Okay, I see. Yeah, of course, we also deploy it separately. All right. Use it. And then do you do you handle like sort of a unstructured data, like a, just a, a log file-ish? Mm -hmm. At the moment, like that's one thing we're looking to add more support for. Like we've mostly focused on structured data in the past, but obviously when you're training LLMs, it's like a lot of data for training LLMs is unstructured. So again, like um, it's not too much. We, we can support that. And like, you know, if you're looking to do that on the platform, then we'd love to partner with you. You yes. know, again, we build stuff on a need to on a like a customer kind of asking for a base so yeah yeah we're i mean internally we have a sort of a log aerial management tools log insight and all those things i'm not sure whether uh, we have some kind of a lot of uh, they're looking they also have an internal um sort of a rca model built in to help help a developer to, you know, to pinpoint root cause quickly based on analysis of logs. So that might be a, a good collaboration point. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible to build plugins for that and it's not too much work. So if you like to collaborate on this, we'll be happy to. Yes, yes, we definitely will reach out and then see whether there's um, uh, some synergy. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes left uh, for the meeting. Maybe um, we have one more topic and we wanted to present um, a roadmap uh, for VDK. Do you think we we can jump for that? Oh, uh, sure, I can do that. Uh, so yeah, uh, again, this is the robot from the open source project. And uh, uh, if you go to the versatile data, data kit repo, uh, the robot can be found in uh, projects. There is a VDK roadmap, uh, which uh, lists all the main initiatives we are planning to complete and some rough and probably not very accurate estimates on when they are going to be finished. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so currently the things that are in progress is uh, documentation improvements where we are uh, making hopefully our documentation, open source documentation, uh, much easier to get started and to navigate, which is something that we find people struggling with. And the other important topic is the notebook integration, uh, which was discussed a few times, uh, which would create would make it much easier to create very static data jobs. And one thing that's adding on top of uh, one of the main challenges in using notebooks, it's actually it's hard to productionize them because they are currently playing mainly used for prototyping. The people tend to copy paste code uh, in order to productionize it separately, which uh, we there's uh, features that are addressing exactly this challenge. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, the next the next uh, items that is being worked on is uh, uh, we need to, see. yeah, the next item is to address troubleshooting and uh, debugging uh, efficiency using versatile data kits. Overall, uh, 
re design a lot of how logging and uh, error handling is uh, being done in Versatile Data Kit to significantly improve error recovery time and error spotting times. Uh, and each uh, initiative uh, includes multiple milestones. Currently, we are in the process of discovery. Of the, that means that we are outlining exactly what would be in the scope and what will be the design of the initiative. Uh, the next one is the uh, wider release of the VDK notebooks. The first alpha release will target primarily only one customer, VMware. Uh, the second release will target uh, anybody in the open source community, the better release. Uh, okay. Uh, the next uh, initiative that we are planning to complete is uh, ability to really get started uh, very quickly with your own data infrastructure. Uh, now those, that means uh, having this kind of guided flow for creating jobs. Actually, I can show up a quick mock-up uh, of what I mean. Uh, like, for example, you'll be able to list different example jobs to get started. Let's say you have jobs for extraction. You'll pick up the job for extraction and you're about to select the sources. Let's say that we pick a REST API, then you'll be able to pick up the destinations. Let's say we pick up Snowflake. Uh, you'll give it the name for the source and the destination. Uh, let's say that uh, our destination will call it Data Warehouse and this is how to generate uh, the data job. Uh, yeah. Uh, once you have to, the auto generated job, we have all the necessary configuration uh, for connecting to the, to the sales database or to the data warehouse, HTTP and Snowflake. And uh, we'll create the actual code for uh, the ingestion. So you'll be able to directly run it and ingest data or modify it to do something more complex. And uh, uh, the, the other epic is uh, ingesting uh, uh, different sources. This is really the epic that this probably will cover part of the functionality for explain about. Hello, are you? Anybody asking questions or is it just somebody unmuting themselves? Yeah, uh, so the, uh, the, the ingest to source epic would, uh, initiative would cover uh, this kind of source abstraction concept, which will allow you to create different sources, for example, GitLab or uh, S3 or uh, Salesforce or whatever, uh, which uh, could be used, for example, during the data set creations uh, in AI ML workloads to very quickly create your data sets and generate some statistics for it because hopefully depending on the, on the source, you have some default stats that you can generate and default ways you can create a data source. Of course, that will uh, be also able to expand with Python as well. And the uh, final uh, in initiative, well, not final, but uh, the, the one that's uh, further along is uh, to be able to create this kind of data unit testing framework. Uh, currently, the way people do testing is really doing data quality checks. Uh, there is nothing that uh, allows you during development time, particularly, to be able to quickly test in, uh, your own transformations, let's say SQL transformations. The goal here is to be able to create this kind of testing unit framework where you can write it transformation, let's say SQL is an example, uh, step by step. Uh, so if you create this kind of simple SQL query, then you can immediately test it with uh, expect with input and expected output, and the framework would help you how to generate the input output and run the test. Uh, so that's very, like five minutes overview of the uh, roadmap. Uh, that I want to present. You can go to VDK Roadmap and click on each of the links. It's public and available where there are more descriptions and details. And for those roadmap that are already in progress, there is also included milestone 
where one can see what's currently being worked on. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Um, yeah, I think for for today, that is all that we had on the our agenda. I just want to say thank you, uh, Anthony, and thank you, Paul, actually, for presenting. Thank you, everyone, for, for who joined for joining. Um, you can find all the um, uh, community meetings that we have on our YouTube channel. Um, basically, here we have in the playlists just versatile data kit, community meetings, and other like tutorials and uh, things that we have done. Uh, explanation also what uh, VDK is doing. Um, we have also on Medium actually versatile data kit um, profile where you can read all the blogs that we have published also that are uh, tutorials and explaining what is VDK and what you can do with it. And uh, yeah, we also have Slack. If you go to our um, GitHub repository and just scroll down all to the bottom, uh, here is the way, uh, here is described how to actually uh, join our Slack channel. And we're usually there and uh, we're quite responsive. So that's it from my side. I think, uh, uh, yeah, um, I think <laughs> we can close with this. And uh, thank you everyone for joining again and uh, see you uh, next time. Our next community meeting is on 30th of August. Thank you. Thanks, guys.